Welcome, I'm Paul Chin, Director of Missional Engagement, and I'm so glad you're here. You're most likely viewing this on our Watch Now page, which we have set up so that you can explore and find most information in one place. From there, you'll find ways to get involved, be connected with others, and to be praying. Whether you're a kid, youth, young adult, or senior, or someone looking for more information on events and upcoming experiences, check out the many features on this page. There are a couple of opportunities I want to highlight for you. We're having a digital mission team this year. WNB is sending a short-term mission team online. In the midst of this pandemic, God is opening up a brand new virtual mission field, and we're building an intergenerational team of WNBers who have a heart to reach people who don't know Jesus. They will explore new and creative ways for online mission and outreach. Together, we'll imagine how technology can be a tool for outreach and discipleship for people who may never step foot inside a church. Learn more and find an application at wmbchurch.ca slash global outreach. We've launched our Christmas webpage with opportunities to celebrate and give our time, talent, and treasure at Christmas time. You'll see a few different opportunities to be a blessing this Christmas, like from Jesus with Love and Adopt a Family. I want to highlight Adopt-A-Family today. Through our one-on-one -on -one coaching and refugee ministries, WMB's Barnabas Missions is deeply connected to folks who without support do not have the means to provide Christmas meals and gifts for their family while keeping up with basic needs. You have the opportunity to adopt one of these individuals or families anonymously. WMB will supply the wish list and you do the shopping and wrapping to make this Christmas special. You can do it on your own, as a family, or join in with your home group to adopt a couple of families. We'll also need volunteers to deliver packages to recipients and for people to donate frozen turkeys. Visit wmbchurch.ca slash Christmas to learn more and sign up. This week brings November 11th, Remembrance Day. On Remembrance Day, we wear poppies and these peace pins. Poppies remember the sacrifice of those who gave their lives for our freedom. And the pins are a reminder that to remember is to work for peace. In all of this, we look to Jesus as the true Savior and the one who brings freedom and peace. We'll take a moment to pause now. We'll pause to remember those who fought and those who were killed in war and all that war brings. We'll pause to insist on the way of Jesus, the Prince of Peace, who alone can restore our broken and hurting world.
Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for those who have given their lives for our peace. And thank you for those that continue to work for peace. And Jesus, thank you for yourself, for your sacrifice, for your death and resurrection that inaugurated a kingdom of peace and freedom. And so, Lord, we look to you to lead us. We look to you to bring peace. And we look to you to bring healing to this world. And Jesus, as we come to you today, we want to lift our hearts to you in worship, to praise you, to glorify you, and to thank you. Holy Spirit, would you empower our worship that it would be beautiful before your throne. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're now going to have a time of musical worship. I encourage you to find a posture that will help you engage with the Lord, whether it's standing, sitting, or kneeling, whether you turn up the volume and sing out loud or quietly reflect. And if, at, if you're at our live watch party, remember that we can't sing, but we can hum, we can clap, uh, we can raise our hands in praise. So remember, the Holy Spirit is with you, empowering your praise along with a community of other believers near and far. Let's praise the Lord together. The Bible says, praise the Lord for the Lord is good. Celebrate his lovely name with music. I know the greatness of the Lord, that our Lord is greater than any other God. That's what we want to celebrate today. There's no one like our God. Nothing compares to the love of our God. Let's worship together.
God calls us to bring all we have to Him in worship, our time, our talents, and our treasure. Thank you so much for the ways you continue to support the work and ministry of WMB Church. If you'd like to give electronically, you can use the links on our webpage or in our app. If you're at our in-person service and have a physical offering, please place it in the giving boxes as you leave the building. We are now going to hear a message about God's love for those around us. Chris is speaking about what it means to be a church that looks like heaven and how to be a church committed to reaching people from all nations that come to KW. How can we minister cross-culturally to one another as God has called us to? So grab a journal, a coffee, whatever you need to get ready. Let's prepare and lean into what God has for us. Un discípulo al cual durante los 10 años que llevaba en el ministerio, el Señor ha puesto en su corazón un especial amor por las naciones. Durante el desarrollo de misiones a corto y largo plazo, ha tenido una transformación personal que lo ha llevado a participar activamente en el soporte de misioneros en diferentes iglesias. 주님께 속한 분들은 이 땅의 많은 나라들을 사랑하고 서로 다른 인종들을 따뜻하게 대하며 천국의 백성으로서 만국과 만인들을 복음을 통하여 주님께 오게 하는 주님의 역사하심을 우리는 알아야 합니다. 하솔 샤이겔서지 케다갈 코이 멜라니 목탈렙 다홀레 고스타르샤스 미션 다한데 니아즈 제디 자메 마시히앗 برای مبارزه با برتری بینی فرهنگی و تعصب نژادی که هر دو صدی در برابر گسترش پادشاهی خداوند در جهان هستند می باشد. کانادا بی اولا کریستوف سیلر ماتیا نالی هرلی اولا کریستوف هرلی کابنی کم پروپی کارسینی اودن نره ویت کندار کرد. wanafunzi wa miaka kumi ambaye anakuwa moyoni mwake jali mataifa mara kwa mara anaombea mataifa mengine na vikundi vya watu ulimwenguni kote akielewa kuwa wanafunzi wote wa Yesu ni sehemu ya familia ya kwa Kristo ulimwenguni nje ya kuta za kanisa la mahali ilipo Welcome everyone. I'm so glad you've chosen to join us as we continue our series all together now and talking about our 10-year disciple characteristic of developing a vision and heart for the nations. As we take a moment to learn from our global partners around the world and discover what it means to hold a posture as a community of ongoing learning from others around the world. In just a moment, we're going to talk to our missionaries in Dortmund, Germany, Alex and Carla Suderman, about their new cross-cultural ministry experience and the learning they've done. Because the nations have come to KW, we as a community need to understand what it means to minister cross-culturally to one another and as a unified expression of Jesus' desire for the church to be one. But before we do that, I want to set the stage for the discussion out of some things I've learned from people of color, particularly two African-American authors and pastors, Dr. Ephraim Smith and Dr. Brenda Salter-McNeil because I want their voice to be heard in this message along with our global partners. Some of you who have been watching from the spring might remember Dr. Brenda Salter McNeil as a guest in our Wednesday Facebook Live show. In that interview, she made a great point about ministering cross-culturally. She taught us that to effectively minister cross-culturally, we need to begin with the understanding that all of us have a cultural background. I don't know if you've seen this sad, funny kind of commercial out there on social media where an Asian woman is asked by a white runner where she's from. And she responds with something like, Vancouver. To which he replies, no, 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 where are you from? Like, are, are you, where are your parents from? Nodding his head like she should know what he means. I mean, come on. 
And she responds again with, Vancouver, my, my parents are from Vancouver. He then says, uh, no, like, where are your ancestors from? And she says Vancouver because several generations back, that's her background. But then graciously says China. And then she asks him, where are you from? And he says, Vancouver. And she says, but where are you from? Like, where are your ancestors from? Nodding her head and expecting him to get it, but he doesn't. Her family has actually been in Canada longer than his family. He too is an immigrant. If we don't have First Nations heritage, we're all immigrants to Canada. So what is your story? What is your heritage? What makes up the story of your family background that has shaped your thinking, culture, and beliefs? It's important for us to understand this when ministering cross-culturally because it is the starting place of our own understanding and communication with one another in relationship. As Dr. Salter McNeil taught us, you cannot value in another what you do not value in yourself. If you haven't done the work for your own cultural context, you won't be able to engage well with someone else's. In premarital counseling, psychologists teach that Family background makes up four of the 12 areas that are most likely to cause divorce in a marriage, if not handled properly. The same is actually true in any relationship. We have to understand and value where we're coming from and where others are coming from if we're going to have a healthy, life-giving relationship where we can learn from one another in meaningful ways. So I want to start with sharing what my family background is today because it has shaped my story but also as a model of awareness, as Canadians from many different nations around the world, we need to be aware of our own cultural backgrounds. We bring a culture to every conversation we enter. God often talks to nations, and Jesus in his John 17 prayer talks about the need for us to be one across ethnicities and cultures for the world at large to really get a picture of the type of diverse community and family the church is meant to be. My parents are both from the Maritimes in Canada, and family has a high value to us. I grew up eating molasses on my bread, fiddleheads, and a lot of seafood. We played crib and asked people who their grandparents were because it helped us to understand where someone was coming from in their thinking. My mom's side of the family came to Canada like most of my relatives in the 1800s. Her dad's family, the Colpits, came in 1775 from England to do a survey of the Bay of Fundy area. Landed in Halifax in 1783 with his wife, also from England, and his seven children. They bought land in what would become the Colpit Settlement area in New Brunswick and settled down. On her mom's side, Madge LeDrew arrived in 1818 with her great-grandfather being born in Edwards Island, Newfoundland. His relatives were from Devon, England. He married a Montgomery whose family profession were knights in England. My dad's side of the family came to Canada from Europe, like my mom's family. His dad was Frank Stevens, whose family was originally named the Stebings from Germany in 1780. And they changed their name to Stevens after the war because of prejudice towards them. My grandmother on my dad's side was Eleanor Stacy, whose original settler was Thomas Stacy, who came to Newfoundland in 1786 from England and then settled in Lewisburg, Cape Breton in 1795. He married Dora G. Lacey, whose family profession was also knights in England. Clearly, I have primarily English-European roots. That means I likely come from Jephthah's family in Scripture, who had a group of descendants, including Ruth, who was in the lineage of Jesus, known as the Moabites, who some scholars believe are the ancestors of the Europeans. But why is it important to know where my family roots are from? Pastor Ephraim Smith teaches that race isn't a biblical concept, but ethnicity is. We see groups of people described by ethnicity, nationality, and tribe within scripture. We see direct social divides between gender, male and female, class, slave and free, and ethnicity, Jew and Gentile, within scripture. But as Jesus walked the earth, he dealt directly with these social divides, with the Samaritan woman at the well in John 4, the healing of the daughter of a Canaanite woman in Matthew 15, the healing of the hemorrhaging woman in Matthew 9, and teaching on care for the poor in Matthew 25. And the Apostle Paul builds on this theology of Jesus in Galatians 3.28, dealing directly with these social divides in Christ. Galatians 3.28 says this, There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. The Jesus community of the church was so different and attractive in Jesus' day to people because the church 
was a place where a divided humanity actually became one united humanity. This was Jesus' plan for the church, to be a united humanity in a divided world. That we would be collectively different as a people of God, as the community of God, as the family of God, we would be united. And until we understand our backgrounds and where we're coming from collectively, we cannot have healthy, integrated relationships. Sadly, the church around the world has moved away from this unified humanity God wants for the church. This picture Jesus gave us in the prayer in John 17 of us being one as he and the Father are one. Jesus said in John 17, verses 20 to 21, talking about the racial and social divides in society at the time, he said, my prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us, that the world may believe that you have sent me. In the history of the church, male dominance, preference to the rich, and segregation have been and still are sadly practiced. But that isn't what the biblical community of the church is meant to be. We're meant to be one in Christ. As Dr. Ephraim Smith teaches in his book, Post-Black and Post-White Church, our identity is no longer meant to be based on skin tone, gender, or class in the church. But we're meant to retain the gift of our ethnicity and nationality. Our culture can offer gifts to one another. We're actually better together. It just shouldn't become an identity greater than Christ or be used as something that divides us or creates hierarchical structures of power. We can actually learn more about what the kingdom of God looks like by learning how each culture has interpreted the gospel from their own background. In this, we see the flaws and limits of our own cultural understanding because other cultures can become a mirror for our own broken understanding of scripture. How we've let our culture or preference that our newly enlightened culture dictates our understanding of scripture rather than letting God's word and original intent define how we understand the issues in our culture. As Dr. Ephraim Smith teaches in Cross-Cultural Awareness, we're taught that we don't want to deny that race, culture, gender, and ethnicity are an issue because it's shaped us and helped us to understand and communicate with one another more effectively. In fact, Dr. Smith would say, there is a continuum of understanding that all people are on that begins with denial. Denial, not seeing ethnicity as an issue at all. Then there's a defensive posture. Defense is defined as a state in which one's own ethnicity is experienced as the only good one. There is minimization, working to minimize ethnicity as issues. Then comes acceptance, recognizing issues of ethnicity and the need to work toward unity, harmony, and reconciliation. Then adaptation, the ability to exercise one's cross-cultural awareness. And finally, what Jesus was going for in the church, and that is integration. Integration is defined as the ability to lead in efforts of unity, harmony, and reconciliation, and thereby living in a healthy, multi-ethnic, and missional community. Paul Chin has led our staff team through a similar intercultural development continuum a few years ago that Dr. Smith talks about here. In the top of the screen, you can see this continuum from Dr. Smith. I'd encourage you to reach out to Paul Chin, our Director of Missional Engagement, to learn more about this. In the new year, Paul and Michelle, who taught with me last week, will be teaching a Disciple Maker course on this. And it's important for us to get there in KW, and particularly at WMB, because our vision is to be a church transformed by Jesus Christ with faith to change the world. And that will mean understanding one another better to reach the world that has come together in KW. To understand where we are on this continuum personally at some point and to seek movement towards reconciled integration. Dr. Brenda says in her book, Roadmap to Reconciliation, that Reverend Martin Luther King Jr.'s hope for the picture of the church looking like heaven on earth, he called the blessed community. The community that represents this multi-ethnic picture of heaven where true integration is incurring. She talks about the word shalom in scripture that we believe means peace or tranquility, but further enlightens our understanding by teaching us that the Hebrew word shalom is actually much bigger and more beautiful than that. Shalom actually encapsulates the Hebrew understanding of the world as God intended it to be. She teaches us 
that in Isaiah 11, 6 to 9, we get a picture of all of creation living together in harmony and peace. This is the shalom. This is God's intended world. Starting at verse 6, the wolf will live with the lamb. The leopard will lie down with the goat. The calf and the lion and the yearling together, and a little child will lead them. The cow will feed with the bear. Their young will lie down together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox. The infant will play near the cobra's den, and the young child will put its hand into the viper's nest. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Truly, God wants all the creation to be in harmony with one another. And then she says not only that, but God's shalom also means the end of violence and war. She teaches out of Isaiah chapter 2, verse 4. He will judge between the nations and will settle disputes for many peoples. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. Instead of developing weapons of war, people will work towards the benefit of others. Shalom means the whole of creation will flourish. No more pain, sickness, disease, crying or dying, sexism, inequality, or discrimination. It's the picture of what heaven is going to be like. Revelation 7, 9 gives us a picture of what this shalom, this heaven, this kingdom of God picture is, this blessed community will look like. When it says in Revelation 7, 9, After this I looked, and there was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, from all tribes, peoples, and languages, standing before the throne and before the land. To quote Brenda Salter McNeil, she says, in this vision, the kingdom of God includes men, women, and children of all ages from every race, every tribe, every nation, and every language. Those particular parts of our personhood aren't going to be erased. No, we're going to keep our skin color. We're going to keep our language, our lingo, and our culture. The world as God intended it is a multicultural, multilingual, multi-ethnic, and multinational place. Can you imagine it? Think about it for a moment. What will it look like? What will it smell like, sound like? When I imagine it, I can see saris and sombreros, yarmulukes and backwards ball caps. I can see gorgeous neck coils and colorful turbans. I can see conceal hats and kimonos and converse. I can smell poi from Hawaii, paroki from Russia, Arapas from Venezuela, and gyros from Greece, congi from Taiwan, and curries from Jamaica and India. I can hear English, Spanish, Swahili, Japanese, Italian, French, Hebrew, Turkish, and Mandarin. I hear Native American drums, and I see Hawaiian and Polynesian dancers. That's a glimpse of the kingdom of God, and I don't know about you, but that excites me. So today, we want to talk to Alex and Carla Sudeman, who just moved to Germany almost two years ago to reach a new culture for them, to learn a new language, and to create the picture of heaven God has in mind in the church in Dortmund, Germany. Let's learn from their cross-cultural experience, the kind of cross-cultural experience that many new Canadians at our church are having here in Canada. And hopefully, all of us are trying to lean into learning about as a church that is committed to the mission of being a church that is transformed by Jesus Christ with faith to change the world. But uh, definitely, we definitely feel as foreigners and largely do because of the language. Um, uh, there, there are obvious like different cultural differences too between Germans and Canadians, but the, the, in many respects, there are similarities between Canada and Germany. We're both Western nations and, uh, you know, shaped by kind of modern values and secularity and things like that. But certainly the language piece, because you just feel like a child, right? You, 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 you recognize like you can learn how to read a text or maybe you can understand what people are saying a little bit, but when you speak, you, you just kind of, it just kind of comes out and then you're trying to fix what you've said, <laughs> you know, like, you just realize how far you have to go. And, uh, and so we definitely empathize with the experience of, of being a foreigner for sure. Yeah, and to have nobody who knows you, they don't know that he's a doctor or that we can speak an, a, any language perfectly, you know? You're starting with such basic yeah. words. And so we understand that. And, and I just wanna say, we also understand that refugees, I mean, there's a big distinction yeah. between choosing to come and leave your home and, and 
and having to. And so we want to respect that that is a huge difference between our choice, but on several levels, yeah, the language and culture. Yeah, we, we understand. <laughs> the grocery store was, was an interesting experience. I fumbled through it and, and it, you know, I had friends to help, which was good, but I do remember the first time I had to mail a letter to Canada and I was like, this should be easy. Right. And no, I was like, first of all, what is a post office called in German? What am I, there's no Canada post anywhere. And then what is a stamp called? How much is it going to cost? What's the process? Like it's yeah, it, the simplest things. And you just feel like totally inequipped, yeah. <laughs> but I, I did it. I can do it now. Two words that, that um, have been really important to me in the last year and a half. Um, the first word that, that the first year was very important was the word patience. Like just being patient with yourself. Like I, I tend to like to have things happen as quickly as possible. <laughs> and, um, and just learning to be patient with yourself, being patient with the, the language, just taking your time and recognizing it will come and uh, being patient with, with people around you and so forth. And that was a kind of a virtue that God kind of spoke to me uh, that I had to learn to live into. And, and kind of embody each day, like how does, what does it mean for me to be patient? It's not gonna happen overnight, right? To become fluent or to know the culture well, it's gonna take some time. The second word is persevere. And, um, and persevering in the sense of um, uh, persevering in, in, in the patience, <laughs> persevering in faith and, and, and just recognizing, okay, God has a plan for us being here. He has, he has called us to be here. And so we, we must just kind of go through what we have to go through. And there's a lot of negative emotions that you, you go through when you experience these waves, you know, that kind of come and crash against you. Um, and also persevering with just not giving up. Like, for example, um, I could see how the temptation, how it would be easy to just find friends that speak English. But it's important for us to keep stepping out and taking that risk each day to try the German, to speak German, and to relate to people who live here who speak the language too. And, uh, and it's amazing how I, I do believe God opens doors and, and, and um, possibilities and, and opportunities for that to happen. Even today, for example, you know, I was, I, I, even today I was struggling with it a bit, you know, because we're a year and a half in. I, I can have a conversation with people, but I'm not fluent to the point that I'd like to be, right? And um, and uh, I went to a coffee shop and lo and behold, a friend that I've been kind of getting to know at this coffee shop, he's working on his master's thesis there. He's a German, happened to be there. And we were able to disconnect and have like an hour long conversation all in German. And it was just like, thank you, Jesus, for that opportunity, you know, like, um, to, yeah, just persevere in that. And I believe that um, it will come, the language will come and all of that, but it's, it's hard. Our kids are a lot older than the typical um, missionary family that starts. Usually they start younger or without kids. And we had so much encouragement when we were processing this decision to come, which I think we needed or else we probably wouldn't have done it. <laughs> so yeah, we had a lot of people tell us this would be you know, good for the kids. And it has been definitely one of the hardest things we've ever done. Thank you, Alex and Carla. Church, we hope you had a chance to see this full interview this past Wednesday on Wednesday Live on Facebook or through our website. You can watch it now through the link. Alex's devotional on Matthew 14 and their experiences cross-culturally are powerful. You don't want to miss that. Because entering a new culture has challenges and blessings to learn from. Opportunity to grow in our understanding of who God is and who we are in our brokenness and humanity. So maybe the starting place of understanding how to minister more effectively to one another in a church that has a vision to see all of the world in KW reach for Jesus is for each of us to learn more about our own background as well as others so we can learn how to communicate effectively and learn from one another. Maybe you have never considered the background of Jesus other than he was Jewish, but Dr. Ephraim Smith in his book, Post-Black and Post-White Church, taught me about the multi-ethnic family background of Jesus. When we look at the family tree of Jesus in Matthew 1 and Luke 3, we see that Jesus himself, the Son of Man, is heir to a great multi-ethnic diversity in his family line. For instance, a woman named Tamar in Jesus' lineage is described in Genesis 38 as a Canaanite woman. And he goes on to say that at one time in the church, people actually used this to create a racial divide in the church. 
Tamar, as a Canaanite woman, was believed to be black. And because she was cursed by Noah, her grandfather, this was used to justify anti-black theology and slavery in the church. Which is amazing to me, because these same people who would justify the enslavement of black people because of this had to realize that this also meant that black blood was running in the veins of Jesus. In fact, if someone was one-eighth black in the history of the U.S., they were considered black and could be enslaved because of it. And Jesus would have been one-eighth black if this was true. Now, what's interesting to me is that biblical scholar J. Daniel Hayes says that the people in Canaan were not even likely black. They were brown. Their culture and language was similar to Israel. What separated them from Israel was the worship of other gods, not race. So not only is this crazy, but the original inference is absolutely wrong. Ephraim Smith continues teaching us that Jesus was a multi-ethnic human being. Canaan's brother Cush was the original inhabitant of Ethiopia and Sudan and Africa. Another brother, Mizram, and his family are the original habits, inhabitants of Egypt. And yet another brother, Fut, and his family are the original inhabitants of Libya, all part of the bloodline of Tamar. Canaan's uncle, Jepheth, has a group of descendants, including Ruth, as I mentioned earlier in the lineage of Jesus, known as the Moabites, who many scholars believe were the ancestors of the Europeans. That means that Jesus' bloodline has Israelis, Palestinians, Ethiopians, Sudanese, Egyptians, Libyans, and various ethnic groups in it. Jesus walked the earth as a multi-ethnic human being. So when Jesus calls us to be one, like he and the Father are one in John 17, 20 to 21, as we read earlier, he's speaking to the unity he has as the multi-ethnic Son of Man, with the Father as one. He is inviting us to become a community that looks different than a divided world. The blessed community, as Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King put it, or a picture of the kingdom of God, as Revelation puts it, or the shalom community, as Dr. Brenda Salter McNeil taught us. So church, has your own self-discovery of your culture led to transformation so that you can be in community and understand both yourself and others better? Have you taken the time to do the hard work of really understanding your own culture, ethnicity, gender, and the assumptions we make about the world because of this background? In home groups this week, we will encourage all of us to share our own cultural background and story, where our families come from, so we can begin to learn about ourselves and others. Would you also pay attention to what your relationships look like? Are we only friends with people who come from our culture and speak our language? I know it can be hard and even tiring to work through translation, but it's worth the work. There's a blessing that comes from cross-cultural community we cannot get from monocultural experience. Which begs the question, are we paying attention to authors we read, the shows we watch, and the leaders we're influenced by or following as well? Are we only learning or being influenced by those who look like us, think like us, that share our cultural background? It's important for us to be learning from people that are different than us. Hopefully today you've seen through this message that we're doing just that as a community. Will you do that work of self-discovery that leads to transformation in Jesus? Would you understand that the culture and background you bring to the diversity conversation? Church to be one, to move to integration with people of differing backgrounds, languages, and cultures that allows us to grow and learn from one another as a unified community, this blessed community of diverse people coming to KW and WMB, to be the foretaste of heaven, to be the picture of what heaven is going to be like, we have to be open to be transformed by Jesus and Jesus and one another. Let's pray. Father, your prayer for us was to be one to recognize who each of us is and who you are and to understand who one another is, that we could be one in following you, that we could learn from one another and grow from the experience. And Father, that is our great desire, to be a picture of the foretaste of heaven for others that look into the church, that they could say, that's what heaven is going to be like. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. Church, I'm so thankful you're part of our church family. Whatever your cultural background is, your ethnicity, first language, gender, or self-defined class, God desires us to be one, one beautiful picture of the church in heaven. 
God bless you this week as you learn about your own background and learn from the background of others about what it means to follow Jesus in this blessed community. Thank you, Chris, for that inspiring message. 
and to our worship team for the beautiful music. If you're watching this on Sunday morning, we'd love to see you in our virtual foyer. It's such a great space. We also have a virtual prayer room, and if you have any prayer requests at all, our volunteers are waiting to welcome you and to pray with you. Thank you so much for spending time with us. We'll see you next week.